Woi woi, woi woi, woi woi. Then it then go on the radio again. Yo, if you want no smoke free weed, go board yourself. You need to go plant a seed. Go board yourself, make your knowledge increase. Go board yourself, go board yourself. Hey, all right. Welcome to episode number 121 of Grow Bud Yourself. Uh, So happy you could be here for this episode. We've got a good one for you guys. Uh, We're going to talk a little news. Uh, We've got an interview with AJ Sour Diesel. That's Joe Murray, uh, the AJ from the AJ Sour Diesel. Uh, We've got our strain of the fortnight, uh, a grow tip on how to spot and execute broad mites, as well as answers to your listener grow questions. So, Please stick around. Episode number 121 brought to you by Seeds Here Now, Sweet Leaf Nutrients, Excelsior Extracts, Prime Superior Inoculant, and our newest sponsor, Purple Rose Supply, Canagar Molds. Whether you're growing from seed or from clone, Prime Superior's simple, safe, and effective products can take your cultivation program to the next level. Prime Superior offers a two-step process that will benefit any garden. This is possible thanks to Prime Superior's proprietary strain of Bovaria bassiana, which is optimized for plants and sets up a symbiosis that increases terpenes, cannabinoids, and yield. Simply coat your seed to inoculate and aid rapid germination or dip your clone cutting with the world's first biological cloning honey and improve growth the way nature intended. Next, continue maintenance on your crop with foliar or fog applications of Prime Superior's Drench, which will boost your plant's growth and ensure a healthy harvest. Best of all, the Drench will work with already established gardens, so anyone at any stage of growth can achieve a cleaner crop with better yields. I gotta tell you, I use this stuff myself, not just on my cannabis, but on houseplants as well, and everything has greened up. Everything is super healthy, whether it's the seed coating product, the cloning honey, which is incredible. The drench is absolutely great. It comes in a spray bottle, uh, pre-mixed, so it's ready to be sprayed. This stuff is incredible. And I have literally noticed more cannabinoids and more terpenes. So it really is an amazing product. And now's the time to try Prime Superior and the world's first biological cloning honey. Grow Bud Yourself listeners can use the code PS420 for 15% off their entire order at primesuperior.com. So don't hesitate, inoculate, and visit primesuperior.com today to learn more. All right, welcome back. As always, thank you to DJ Jacques and Win Strong for the incredible grow bud yourself theme song this is episode number 121 uh pretty amazing uh very very proud of uh of how many of these episodes we've been able to put together for you guys i hope uh i hope you guys enjoy them i hope we're helping you grow uh and i hope we're helping you uh you know enjoy growing as well because it's it should be fun you know i recently just did a uh a an appearance on an on a our friend chad uh Westport's podcast and basically just talked about how growing should be fun. And if it's not fun, then it's just another job. So, you know, keep the joy, enjoy the grow and, uh, and cultivate yourself and plants. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. Uh, Michael, how are you? Oh, you know, I'm hanging in there. Cool. Cool. Oh, well, uh, yeah. here we are. Episode 121. We and, made it. uh, we made it. And, you know we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> continue to make it and uh yeah what do we got out there in the world of, of cannabis news nuggets yeah let's talk some cannabis news here uh first story that kind of caught my eye is the world anti-doping agency so i think everyone knows despite kind of growing support to remove cannabis from banned substances lists and sports the world anti-doping agency or wada continues to prohibit pot use by athletes. Just last year, the agency decided to continue its policy of banning marijuana. And now WADA has published an editorial in the journal Addiction. I'm sure Dan has his subscription. I know mm-hmm. I've got my my copy right here. And that uh, the the editorial explains the group's thinking for continuing their policy. And uh, they specifically state that pot use violates, quote, the spirit of sport. They also believe that using cannabis makes athletes unfit role models 
and claim that their impairment puts others at risk. According to WADA, uh, quote, the welfare and safety of other participants may be compromised by impaired judgment associated with the presence of cannabis in an athlete in competition. The agency couldn't quite agree if cannabis use enhances or has the potential to enhance sports performance, but they acknowledge that athletes who use pot do benefit as it facilitates recovery and reduces pain. Wada's experts also believe that marijuana use can cause psychiatric symptoms and compromises athletes' health. However, it should be noted that Wada did raise the threshold of THC present in tests and it doesn't specifically prohibit athletes from using cannabis outside of competition, but they are sticking with the pot ban in competition, which on one hand, it's odd, as we've seen the NBA, NFL, even MLB, they all essentially are accepting cannabis use to some extent. But on the other hand, this makes perfect sense as the World Anti-Doping Agency literally exists to deal with substance use in sports. And you could argue that it's not really in their best interest to start eliminating banned substances, since banned substances are the reason the agency exists in the first place. <laughs> right. <laughs> they could uh, policy themselves right out of existence. They're going to be out of business, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I don't know. It all seems silly to me to, for them to even be talking about pot policy for sports when there's, uh, you know, they're called the anti-doping agency. They should be more concerned with... Uh, actual you know performance enhancing steroids and things like that although you know ultimately I, you know my policy is just let people do whatever they want and actually put it on their jerseys you know so that i can <laughs> i can root for the <laughs> i can root for the pot guys and uh you know if you're into the roids or whatever you root for the roids guys and if you're into you know anything else you got your people and it's on their shirt so you know you know who to support and uh who to send uh, special packages to there you go. So I don't see that happening, but uh, but I know your policy. You don't care if they sprout an extra head as long as they're hitting home runs and, and doing exciting things out there. So, well, I mean, they're grown people. They can do whatever they want. They're, right. they're, their job is just to entertain us with with games. <laughs> so, you know, if they want to hurt their bodies, I, you know, more power to them. But I just I don't see uh, myself wanting to police uh, what an adult puts in their body for any reason really and i wouldn't say they were necessarily pro steroid but steroids did save baseball to an extent back in 1998 baseball was on the way out and then mark mcguire and sammy sosa juiced themselves up to the gills and just started crushing balls and everyone was like oh baseball's fun yeah so, the whole idea of it i mean that people aren't in the, the guy with the most home runs isn't in the hall of fame you know what i mean like come oh, on yeah, it's insane it's just ridiculous yeah it's goofy you know, Barry Bonds for, for the Hall of Fame, everybody. Come on. Let's... And, the, you know, I mean, I could digress even further, but this whole like person on second base in the 10th inning thing. The Manfred is... man, the Ugh. ghost runner. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's ruining the sport for me. I just I can't even take it seriously. Do you, do you like the pitch clock? Uh, I guess. You know, okay. I mean, yeah, it speeds the game here. up a little bit. I just, I don't, I don't know where that runner on second came from. I don't <laughs> understand the statistics, statistically how that works. And I, I just don't like it. I think, you know. Statistically, it works that they, they don't want games going over three hours anymore. And they're willing to literally try anything to stop them from doing that. Okay. So. Well, I'll put a runner on, on every base and every inning. I, I don't know. You know, it just <laughs> seems weird. It, it doesn't make sense. To oh, me. I it's agree. Not, yeah. it's, 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 it's silly. It's a silly way to decide the end of a game, in my opinion. Well, that's fair. <laughs> so Rob Manfred, take note. Uh, so that was that's WADA, which I it sounds a little strange to say that, but WADA, WADA, WADA. Let's move on to this is a weird one, man. Um, OK, so get this. Uh, Pennsylvania legalized medical cannabis back in 2016. That's no, not the weird part. Um, the However, the state has a law on its books that makes anyone caught driving in possession of their medical marijuana card automatically guilty of DUI. So basically, Pennsylvania has a zero tolerance policy for driving with any Schedule 1 drug. And federally, cannabis is a Schedule 1 narcotic with a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical value. We all know this. Uh, but because of this, just showing a cop your medical pot card while you're driving in Pennsylvania makes you guilty of DUI. 
And that's whether you're actually impaired or not. So this insane glitch in the state's DUI law, which assumes impairment simply because a driver has been issued a medical cannabis card, it could be fixed as a new bill from Senator Camera Bartolotta would leave the question of impairment up to field sobriety tests, which seems like a much better system than a laminated piece of cardboard. However, until that bill passes, uh, medical cannabis cards are automatic proof that you're driving under the influence. So Pennsylvania drivers, please be aware, and at the very least, just don't show your card to cops, because for some very stupid reason, that's the equivalent of blowing a .08. Nah, that's very dumb, too. I mean, <laughs> the, hopefully this the bill will get rid of this, because that's... Uh, it's insane. Really, yeah, totally insane. All right. So that's a silly thing in Pennsylvania. And let's just do a last uh, couple here. This is um, these are good things. So we got some records going. Uh, Massachusetts has now sold over five billion dollars of recreational cannabis since the adult use market kicked off in 2018. Despite being five years old, the market continues to grow as the state set records in three consecutive months this summer, beginning in June, ending in August. In August, sales reached nearly $140 million, which brought the year-to-date total for the first eight months of 2023 to $1.05 billion. That's impressive. Uh, Adult-use cannabis has also been a massive hit in Maryland, where medical dispensaries got the okay to begin selling recreational pot in July. Retailers sold more than $10 million of cannabis products over opening weekend of adult use sales, and $87 million of cannabis was sold in the month of July. Now the August numbers uh, are in, and they're even more impressive as Maryland dispensaries sold nearly $92 million worth of pot products last month. Flour has been the most popular in Maryland since adult use sales began. Uh, That accounted for more than $55 million in August. Uh, of August's $92 million of sales. Concentrates also represented a major chunk of the market, bringing in $24.7 million, and infused consumables accounted for $11.4 million. So uh, a lot of uh, recreational and just general pot product sales in Massachusetts and Maryland. Sales everywhere this summer, going crazy. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent indeed. (laughs) (laughs) There you yeah, go. I mean, that's good news. Like you said, I think, you know, the more more money that comes in from the legal market, the the more I think it's going to spread uh, around the country and around the world. Indeed. Five billion dollars in five years of uh, adult use sales in Massachusetts. Very impressive. New York is going to going to do even better if we could ever get off the ground here. But that's a bit of a look at what's going on in the world of weed. We have a really interesting interview coming up, and uh, it's with an old friend. Yeah, absolutely. It's our friend Joe Murray. He's better known as AJ Sour Diesel, uh, and he has been uh, the guy with the diesel since you know the '90s. And uh, he's now going to be releasing uh, uh, AJ Sour Diesel into the legal New York marketplace. So it's like kind of a triumphant return here uh, for him, and uh, we're very excited about that. Um, that's being grown by Flower House, who we've had on the show as well uh, in uh, slightly upstate New York. And uh, I have seen it growing. It's beautiful and amazing and uh, very much looking forward to seeing that on the legal marketplace. And uh, yeah, why don't we take a break and come back with AJ Sour Diesel. We'd like to tell you about our latest sponsor, Purple Rose Supply. Purple Rose Supply's Canagar molds give you the tools you need to smoke more and roll less. Spending time rolling multiple joints can take a long time, preventing you from doing what you actually love. The solution? More smoking, less rolling, with a cannabis cigar that burns longer. So how does it work? Weed is compressed into the mold, with the skewer placed in the middle for airflow. Since the weed is tightly compressed, it leaves less space for air pockets in your roll, giving you a slower burn. Even with the smallest size canagar mold that holds 1-2 to two grams, you're getting more out of your grams in a canagar as opposed to a regular blunt since it burns way longer. And... Purple Rose Supply offers mold sizes all the way up to 10 to 14 grams for when you have a larger group of friends. If you're a grower, 
Canagars can also be a way to showcase the strains you grow and take your smoke experience to an entirely new level. Learn more at purplerosesupply.com. Follow them on Instagram at purplerosesupply. And don't forget to use code GBY20 for 20% off your order. All right, welcome back. And we have a very special guest for you guys this week. Uh, our old friend Joe Murray, aka AJ uh, of the AJ Sour Diesel. Uh, welcome, AJ, to the show. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you on here. Uh, we've known each other a long time. And uh, as the kids say, if you know, you know, right? That's the big thing these days. If you know, you know. Well, I would say that for certain. Uh, about the real uh, AJ Sour Diesel, which to me is the real Sour Diesel. There's so many different versions out there um, and have been for years. You know, there's like a Cali version, a Canadian version. Um, there's something called East, East Coast Sour Diesel. Um, there's a Sour Diesel uh, seeds that Soma sells over in Amsterdam. Um, so there's a bunch of different versions of Sour out there. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about just your background, actually, before we get into the sour, just your background um, and how it came to be that uh, that you became AJ. Well, um, I guess the best place to start is, uh, you know, in the early 90s, I, a group of friends and I we were all on Grateful Dead tour and we started becoming like really competitive about who could come up with the best weed. You know, we all wanted the best weed, but it, it became almost like a contest to see who could, who could really like produce the best weed at the end of uh, uh, every show or, and that kind of bled into uh, our lives. When we uh, went home back to New York, um, we kind of all were very always looking for something better, always trying to find the best, uh, weed out there and that that drive uh, led me to meeting um, guys like JJ and Mike Klopp and you know uh, hanging out at wetlands and so for me that's where the story really gets started is when uh, you know meeting uh, Mike Klopp at wetlands and that's you know the first time that I ever saw the chem dog and um yeah and that kind of like that kind of put everything in a, in a in a there was a few varieties back then that kind of were in a different class and uh and so chem dog the chocolate thunderfuck um things like that um you know that was the way to to win the contest and have the best weed so um you know the first time i ever bought chem dog from mike klopp you know, we had been calling all weed that was really strong, you know, diesel as an adjective. But, um, you know, when we first spoke to chem dog, I turned to my friend and I was like, this is the diesel. There is no never calling anything else diesel again. This is the diesel. And my friend was like, yeah, what was he calling this stuff again? Dog or something? I was like, it doesn't even matter, dude. This is the fucking diesel. And and so that's kind of like how the whole the whole diesel thing got started. It was uh, what we called Mike Klopp's chem dog. Now, would that be the 91 or the D? Do you know, like, in that particular? That was the 91. Right. Okay. So the 91 uh, became the diesel. And then is there super skunk or anything like that involved? Uh, was there, like, some kind of uh, pollination of that chem 91? Or is it just a pheno of the 91? It's a good question. I mean, nobody really knows. Um, you know, all we do know is that, you know, um, it happened. Uh, I always thought the super skunk was like the the culprit, but um, but if you ask Klopp, he'll say no, it was NL five or some or this or that or you know something else. So I, who knows? Um, I always thought it resembled the super skunk. I'd, I I grew super skunk from Sensei C back in the day. And uh, and I know that Mike Klopp had just acquired Super Skunk from Sensei C uh, around that time in 
in 90, I believe in 94, uh, he went to Amsterdam and brought back a plethora of, of genetics from Sensi and I think homegrown fantasy. And, uh, and so, yeah, who knows? Um, at, but at that point, you know, we start, cause at that point we were getting, what I know of it is that we were getting NL5, we were getting super skunk and we were getting chem 91 from, from Klopp. And so basically, uh, the chem 91, something pollinated the chem 91. It could have been super skunk. It could have been the NL5. Uh, and that pheno basically that came out of that became the sour diesel that everyone oh, knew. I well, that, that, that's what I always thought, but, but then upon, uh, uh, you know, learning more later on, you know, just even in the last five years, I've, I've, cause we never talked about this stuff back in the day, really. Like we didn't really, uh, you know, we didn't really talk much between growers about this and that. And, and, and if we did, you know, it was hard to remember, but, um, but apparently, from what I've been told, is that is that uh, one of the one of Klopp's seeds made its way up to the Catskills, where it then was uh, crossed or pollinated by another one of Klopp's seeds, and then that and and it was then that the sour was conceived. So that's to the best of my knowledge, that's what's at, that's what happened. I mean, um, you know. Everyone will tell you a different story, but I, for, from the most reliable sources I have, that's what happened. Right. So, uh, so basically, what I would say is, is, and and as has been told, is that you didn't so much create it, but um, basically sort of discovered it from a happy accident and became sort of the servant and the keeper of the strain. And uh, I mean, it, we all had seeds from Co-op that we were running back in the day. You know, as soon as we got seeds, we all became growers. So, because we, we needed to have as much diesel as possible. And so, basically, all those things we were calling diesel. And, um, and it was, it was the Albany kids that, 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 uh, uh, that came up with the sour diesel, you know, and, and, and I believe that was in 96. And, uh, and I was running uh, a different diesel uh variety you know that was from also from Klopp and um yeah so it was around 97 that I first got the first cut of what they were calling sour and I you know I started running them uh running them back to back with uh running that back to back with the 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 diesel seed that I was running and um yeah, the sour basically won the popularity contest. And so, you know, around 98, I decided, all right, let's just grow this, this one cut because that's the one that's making people the craziest. I mean, it was all made <laughs> crazy, but like what, what's making them the most crazy? It's this. So, so yeah, so at, from, from 97 on, it was the sour. That was the cut we went with. And yeah, they called it the AJ cut because I was the guy in New York, always setting up new grows, always trying, always sourcing out more. You know, I sold cuts to tons of people. Uh, you know, they were always supposed to grow it and bring it back to me, but that rarely ever happens. But, um, but, um, but yeah, so it was, and it was really unbeknownst to me. I knew, I knew that people called it the AJ because in my immediate circle. But it wasn't until like 2013 or 14 that I that someone brought it to my attention that they were calling it the AJ cut all over America and the world. <laughs> and that was totally unbeknownst to me. You know, I, I certainly wasn't I didn't have a marketing strategy or anything to make that happen. I was trying to, like, you know, be unknown. Right. Well, what happens is it just it's so strong and so different. I mean, this was uh, something that could really sort of narc you out. You know, I remember, uh, you know, the first few times at the High Times office when, you know, the AJ would come around uh, and it would really just fill up the entire office, the entire building, really. Like you could smell it in the, in the, 
in the elevator, in the lobby of the building. And, you know, it was like, that's when food sealers basically became a must. Like you had to seal up those bags because otherwise everywhere you went, whether you went on the subway train or wherever, everyone knew, you know, I mean, it was like uh, so skunky. So let's actually talk about what sets uh, that sour, um, the AJ sour apart, because from what I remember, um, you know, it's kind of a dark almost like a forest green underneath it all, uh, kind of real kind of dark. And then with really sort of bright um, neon almost uh, and, and white crystals covering, um, covering the dark sort of forest green flower. So it was like this light and dark, um, tons of just very frosty trichomes, uh, sort of a bright neon bright green on top of that dark green um, and then sort of rust colored hairs or pistols um, and that fuel that diesel smell right um, what are your sort of uh, mem memories of that sour the, the 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 sour of the 90s um I mean uh... I don't know. I mean, I looked at it so much. Uh, uh, I, I was fully immersed in it. What I heard, what, but I mean, the sour, it was actually a limier colored flower. It was, it was the, the leaves that were like dark green. Um, right. And, um, and yeah, and the trichomes were, you know, not as like huge as like, uh, like, you know, OG trichomes or, 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 you know, Afghani or something, but they, they were a little smaller, but it was, yeah, very, it's very resinous for sure. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm more, I remember the flower less than I remember the, just the, the effect that it had on my life and on, on the world as it, as it, as it made its way around. Um, yeah, like, I mean the potency level. One who becomes, you know, extremely famous, and it's like uh, I knew I knew that person before they were a huge celebrity. You know, like that's just my buddy. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and that's how I've always felt about the sour. Like, oh, sour, yeah, that's my friend. Um, and yeah, it had and it had a huge effect on my life because you know, it's like as a young man, you know, it's, it was sort of like, it was, it was a rise to power, you know? And so, you know, I'm, I learned all about like tyranny and, you know, like, uh, abuse of, of, of authority and, uh, you know, having control over people, which probably wasn't the, it's, it's, it what probably wasn't the best thing, you know, like I had to, it took me years to like tame the monster within myself that was like looking to like, you know, be an absolute tyrant about it because I could pretty, it pretty much gave me the, it gave me the opportunity to shape my life any way I wanted to live it. Yeah. I mean, we should mention that the A in AJ stands for asshole, right? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that's, that's not why they named me asshole, but it might be why it's stuck. But, <laughs> and at the same time, I mean, I wasn't that bad, you know, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't uh, uh, an evil dictator, but, but, um, but, you know, I'm, I, I was human. And so, uh, and also, I mean, there were, there were people coming at me, everybody in the world wanted something from me so that created like a temperament where it's like uh what does this guy want you know like uh you know i know what this guy wants you know like um and so i had kind of had to like pick and choose you know who who could have it because um there wasn't enough for everybody who wanted it and so i kind of like and i had to cut people out of my life because i just i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't give them what they wanted and so yeah it kind of perpetuated the whole asshole thing for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean that, and, and of course the sour moniker too, I mean, some people would say that, uh, you know, the sour came from, from the aroma or the flavor, but other people will tell you that it really made people sour. Like it turned people against each other. It, it uh, you know, French, it ruined friendships and partnerships here and there. Uh, so, you know, it does have that, you know, it's, sort of. Yeah, no, and I, I, I always said, you know, I think they call it that because of me, but, um, <laughs> but, um, well, the, you knew the worth of it. I mean, you knew that it was 
worth more than what el everything else that was around. And I mean, that was also, uh, uh, you know, the timing of it coming around in the mid to late 90s was the same time as the shift from Dinkins to Giuliani, which was for New Yorkers, a major, major shift, particularly for uh, anybody in the weed scene, because prior to Giuliani, it was like pretty wide open. I mean, you could smoke out, you know, outdoors, you could drink a beer in a paper uh, bag. Um, things were definitely more lenient. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Giuliani came, shut down all the weed spots and really cracked down hard on any kind of um, smoking and, and dealing and growing and everything. Um, and that also, you know, the delivery services were born out of, you know, the shutting down of the weed spots. Now suddenly, you know, things had to become more discreet. Um, but you could get fifty dollars for two grams, right? I mean, if you delivered it to some, right, or even a hundred, at some point. I mean, I remember sour uh, being, you know, eight thousand dollars a pound. I remember people paying five fifty an ounce, um, and that was people who knew people. I can't yeah. imagine what people on Wall Street were paying. You know, I mean, I've definitely heard of, you know, thousand dollar ounces, two hundred and fifty dollar quarters, for sure. You know, yeah, in those days, the sales pitch was um, the hookup is not the price; it's the fact that you're getting it. You know, right? I mean, and and that alone, because there's only a certain amount coming around. It wasn't like mass produced at all either. Um, and let, well, let's talk a little bit about just the uh, the potency level. I mean, this was something that you know you'd be high for two hours plus uh, from from smoking real sour very cerebral buzz um very for me very uplifting and creative uh inspirational in a lot of ways i mean you know people would describe that as a sativa dominant type of buzz but certainly there's been a lot of controversy over you know where where sour diesel is classified in in the uh yeah i think you know. well i think like i've always said i think people anyone who really Consider sour diesel a sativa hasn't been smoking haze or NL5 haze. I mean, I've always considered those things to be sativas. I've always looked at the sour as a hybrid. You know, the cam is not a sativa. You know, NL5 is not a sativa. The, uh, you know, um, super skunk, you know, right. It's not sativa. These are hybrids, and that, so I've never, I've never really looked at sour and thought to myself, "That's a sativa," you know. I'm, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hybrid, but you know, um, you know, we, we, and other people, you know, all got hung up. I've, but, and, and I get it too because I, I've collected sour cuts over the years of what people think is sour, and you know, some of these cuts that I've collected can take eighty-five days to finish. So you know, I mean, I could see where you would, you know think that you know, okay this is sativa i think a lot of the sour that some people were smoking maybe was leaning on sativa but but the but the the original sour was kind of right down the middle right right i think it's the thin leaves too i mean that kind of is one of those things it's like well thin leaf you know sativa but really uh yeah i mean and and obviously it's it's more complicated than that 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 terpene profile though um, now that it's been tested, um, very high in limonene, uh, caryophylline, and myrcene, um, three pretty important terpenes, uh, which combined with you know a, a pretty good amount of THC uh, and other cannabinoids, really just results in 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 a amazing potency level, uh, and even kind of like that sweaty forehead, <laughs> you know, thing that would happen. Sometimes if you did like a too big of a bong hit or something like that, you know, it would really uh, cause actual physical effects for some people. I, I never, I've, I dropped so many people just by, you know, passing them a joint at concerts, you know, people would say, hey, man, can I try that? You know, and I'd say, be careful. And next thing you know, the guy's on the floor, you know, twitching out and his friends are saying, what did you do to him? And, you know, I'm running away. And uh, <laughs> it, became like, it was kind of a regular occurrence. Where I, I wasn't trying to do that to people. I would always tell them, just take a little. It's very strong. But, you know, uh, a lot of people didn't 
uh, heed that warning. And yeah, I, on multiple occasions, people I knew and people who were total strangers just dropped and uh, and hit the floor. <laughs> That's amazing. It's terrifying to be involved in like a situation like that. You're like, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they think you're laced, you know, you might have <laughs> laced it with something. And I'm sure that that was a Actually, like we were scared of we were terrified back then and that was like the worst also the worst possible time to be walking around with something that had an uncontainable smell um because we were all paranoid and people were getting just swept up you know for tnt and all that stuff people were just getting swept up and sent to jail you know like for minding their own business and walking down the street so yeah i was i was pretty I was pretty terrified of, of spending a night in the tombs. So, uh, so yeah, when that would happen, I would just break out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, let's talk about more, uh, the present time. Now you have, uh, obviously things have evolved. Um, laws have changed and now, uh, the original AJ Sauer is going to very soon be available legally for people and so let's talk about that a little bit yeah well um sid gupta who started flower house has been uh, uh uh in contact with me for years trying to you know when he was with natura we were going to do something there when he was um you know uh when he first got to new york uh uh you know he was a very enthusiastic and uh yeah he it was sid finally convinced me to uh to leave california to leave my cozy good easy life out there and you know so i'm i'm literally i'm just coming out of the bush you know like i i'm, I'm i've been back in new york for a month now and um and yeah we're gonna do we're gonna release some sour within uh you know a couple months sometime and I was just at the farm today. It looks good. You know? Nice. And uh, that's going to be legally available at licensed shops uh, throughout New York State, right? In New York City. Yes. Um, and hopefully there'll be some more of those open soon. Yeah, well, that's amazing. And to me, uh, that seems to be like everything coming full circle, you know, from the sort of paranoid uh, craziness of the 90s uh, and, and, and hiding and, and all of that to now basically being able to, uh, legally have that AJ Sauer available to the general public. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And uh, I think, you know, obviously we've come a long way. What are your, your thoughts on, on just basically how, how much things have changed now in 2023? Well, I don't know about you, but I honestly never believed this would even happen. And there's part of me still thinks it's some kind of trap. <laughs> Can't get used to it, but um, you know, hopefully, hopefully one day the thought of being, uh, you know, fearful about using cannabis will be absurd. Um, but for me, it's still like a real fear. Like I don't, I don't want to smoke weed on the street if there's a cop there. You know, like I'll oh, just go over here. You know, and back in the day, I wouldn't even think of smoking weed on the street. If someone was smoking weed on the street, I got far away from them uh, because, yeah, I just knew too many people that spent the weekend in the, in the tombs. Yeah, and I mean, for growing, you would get a lot more than a weekend. I mean, you'd probably get sent upstate, uh, you know, for, for years. Yeah, for what I was doing, absolutely. You know, I might still be there. Right, <laughs> I exactly. I was very fortunate that that, that didn't happen because there were – many there was some close calls and and there were times when you know uh, uh i was terrified that that was actually about to become reality but somehow i made it through the cracks yeah you know and it's that notoriety that can get to you as well i mean when people are are whispering your name all over town you know and 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 it's still totally illegal and you know i had the same conversation with g uh our friend greg chemdog you know we were standing there at one point uh and 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 smoking legal cannabis in at a licensed legal event and i said you know isn't it amazing you know where how far we've come and that we don't have to look over our shoulders all the time and he said yeah 
but I still do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that thing, you know, it's ingrained in us. Uh, and like you said, it still kind of feels like a trap, right? Like they got us all to come out of the, <laughs> the woodwork and, and now they're just going to round us all up uh, and, and do what they wish they could have done years ago. Um, but I think luckily that's not the case. And I think we are in a, in a, in a position where we're watching history be made. Uh, and that history was made by people like us who, who were there in those, in those times and, and really, you know, kept that, the love of the plant and, and the, the whole spirit alive in the face of a lot of, uh, of, resistance you know not just resistance but outright uh you know aggression <laughs> yeah i mean we never had a choice though because it's like we knew that you know we weren't about to give up the weed so i mean the conditions just were what they were um yeah i mean maybe i was just a little crazy too and and you know just took wild chances but um but yeah, I mean, I knew from the time that I was very young that I was going to be involved with weed as pretty much from the first time I tried it, I knew I was going to be somehow mixed up in weed. When I was a kid, I used to have dreams where I had a huge garbage bag full of weed and I would like wake up and, you know, be depressed about it. And it was like, if I could just get a huge, huge bag of weed, everything would be okay. And that's kind of the premise that I set off. I set off on when I when I uh, graduated high school was you know to get that huge bag of weed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things I, that I it's unique for me about you know the real AJ Sauer Diesel uh, is really the medicinal aspect for me personally. I mean, I think it really helps uh, relieve stress, uh, relieve fatigue, uh, and even uh, to help deal with depression and sort of anxiety and things like that. I, I know for some people, uh, it can cause a bit of paranoia, but I think depending on your demeanor and who you are, it can really treat a variety of, uh, of, of ailments. Paranoia can be good. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, being paranoid is the reason why I never went to, to prison. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was smoking, I was paranoid and, and, and trying to lay low. So, yeah. And, and yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've learned pretty much er almost everything from being around cannabis, uh, whether it's like learning things about myself, like I said, be becoming a tyrant and then having to like step down and say, OK, you know, like you don't have to control everybody, be the king of the universe just because you can. And it kind of I don't know, I learned I learned lessons about myself just through, you know, having, you know, great weed that everybody wanted. I, it, I learned lessons of human nature and I learned. Um, yeah, and obviously anything that makes you less bitter and angry is a useful tool, with, especially if you live like in a city like New York, um, where, you know, you can freak out over, you know, something 10 times a day. Uh, smoking weed has kept me totally grounded, I guess, com well, maybe not, but comparative to, to, to how I would have been without it. Absolutely. Uh, now, how can people find out more about... Uh flower house and the sour that will be on the market very soon and keep up with you basically on social media and the internet uh well there, we got get dot sour on instagram as the time approaches we're going to be doing promotion there i'm going to be promoting it on my instagram aj sour diesel and flower house as an instagram and they'll be you know we're gonna we're gonna announce it when it's when it's time. Well, that's pretty it. awesome. Yeah, it's all seems to have come full circle and it'll be really interesting to see what the next few years have in store for us uh, all here in New York and beyond. Uh, but we've certainly uh, come a long way. I want to say thank you uh, to Joe Murray, uh, AKA AJ, <laughs> uh, for being on the show. Uh, any sort of final words you have out there for people that are interested in 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 you and the sour diesel and all of the the history and information um well i mean i 
I answer questions about it all day. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of different narratives going around. And uh, so, yeah, I find myself answering a lot of questions about sour all the time. Some people say sour is gone. It's never coming back. Some people say, uh, uh, you know, or want to know more and more about the history. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm still immersed in it. Every, not a day goes by where I'm not answering questions and, you know, and if I have advice for people, it's grow weed. Everyone should grow weed. Right. Now, what, what do you say to people who do say that sour has gone and, and that, you know, it's not the same as it was back then? It's always been a very small circle. I mean, uh, uh, it's always been that way. I mean, the good sour comes in small batch and it's, and, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it's historically always been something that's very difficult to get. So that hasn't changed. And I think a lot of the people out there who think they've had it, haven't actually had it. <laughs> right. And so whatever yeah. they're calling uh sour diesel isn't, isn't the age. They probably had something good, obviously, because they remember it. And, and, and there's a lot of great imposters out there, but there's only one original. Perfect. All right. Well, why don't we leave it at that? There's a lot of imposters, but only one original. Okay. And uh, thank you so much, AJ, for being on the show. And uh, we will be back after these messages. All right, all you cannabis connoisseurs, we have a very special announcement for you. SeedsHereNow.com is elevating September with deals that will make your buds burst with joy. Place an order this month and Seeds Here Now's got you. For the month of September, you will snag a free limited single seed of London pound cake with every order. That's a garden game changer right there. For those with an apple flavored obsession, you're also in for a treat. Dive deep with 25% off strains like Applejack and the oh-so-tempting Caramel Apple Kush. And if you're tired of domestic shipping costs eating at your grow budget, we've got you covered again. Simply use the code DANKOSHIP, that's D-A-N-K-O-S-H-I-P, and you'll get free shipping with your order at SeedsHereNow.com. You'll want to keep checking back with Seeds Here Now for incredible upcoming sales, including a Grandparents' Day special, the Fall Equinox celebration, and of course, those wild weekend flash sales throughout September. It's like a festival of foliage deals. So head over to SeedsHereNow.com, enter Danko Ship, and let your garden flourish in style. Keep it green, nurture those dreams, and remember, with the right seeds and knowledge, you'll always be in for a bountiful harvest. All right, welcome back, and thank you to AJ, uh, AJ Sauer, for doing the uh, the interview there. Um, hope you guys learned something about the sour and more. Um, yeah, so we're in the cultivation segment. It has been a fortnight. <laughs> and yes, this is a fortnight. And yes, this is a fortnight. Strain of the, the fortnight. fortnight. What do you yeah. got for us? Uh, what do you got for us this week? Strain of the fortnight. <laughs> Strain of the Fortnite. <laughs> there it is. We love hearing and... that. Uh, it's our it's our favorite thing. It gets us going. Hope it, we hope it gets you going too. And it signifies that it is time for our Strain of the Fortnite, of course. So, Dan, what strain would you like to highlight this Fortnite? Yes. So this Fortnite, I want to highlight uh, a strain called Mango Freezer. Uh, and this is from Canarado Genetics, Can C A N N A R A D O, uh, Canarado Genetics. They are known for uh, strains like Sunday Driver. Uh, a lot of people know Grape Pie. A bunch of really amazing, uh, amazing strains. And you know they've been around for I think a, a pretty long time. I want to say 2008 or something like they've been around. Um, and they have some great strains, but this one is the Mango Freezer. It's actually a cross between Mango Haze and a hybrid of uh, Fried Ice Cream and Grandpa's Gunchist, uh, which I'm not super familiar with. But uh, certainly there's this freezer line uh, that they've put out with a bunch of different uh, freezer sort of based genetics. Uh, lemon freezer, grape freezer, uh, sundae. 
And uh, the mango one is one of them. And as I mentioned, it is mango haze crossed with the fried ice cream and grandpa's gunches. So what you're going to get is that like hazy high for sure. Like the, the no ceiling kind of high you get from a good haze. Um, so you keep smoking it, keep getting higher. Um, that mango and ice cream kind of scent and uh, and flavor, which is really amazing. Uh, and, uh, you know, a decent, not too long of a flowering time, uh, 70 to 80 days or so. Um, the average yield, uh, to average to higher yield. Um, the strain will stretch a bit. Um, and you're getting regular seeds uh, for this. And they're actually available uh, at Seeds Here Now, uh, which is our sponsor, SeedsHereNow.com. And you can always use that code uh, Denko Ship uh, for free shipping on uh, seeds. And these are very affordable. These are $88 um, and 88 cents uh, and come along with the free shipping. Um, you're going to get a 10 pack uh, and there are going to be regular seeds. So you, there will be males and females there in the bunch. Um, if you're interested in breeding with it, uh, you can keep a male and some of the pollen. Uh, otherwise, I would say keep the females only. Uh, keep one as a mom if you'd like to keep taking cuttings or just grow it out and flower it uh, and see if you like it. And if you do, you can always buy another pack. Um, anyway, the Canarado Mango Freezer is just one of those uh, really amazing strains. It really fills the air with a, a very unique smell. Like I mentioned, fruity from the mango, creamy from the ice cream, uh, and uh, really uh, just the high too. It's really, it's kind of like a, a tropical fruit dessert uh, after a nice meal, you know, it's just really an amazing strain. So uh, please give it a try. Uh, mango Freezer from Canarado Genetics, available at seedsherenow.com. Um, use that code Danko Ship. That's a new code um, for free shipping from Seeds Here Now. And uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoy that. Um, that is our strain of the fortnight, Mango Freezer. And now I think uh, we'll move on to the cultivation segment uh, or the cultivation tip or trick, uh, which this week is going to be about how to identify and get rid of broad mites. Um, these are a type of mite different from a spider mite, uh, but equally as destructive and equally as hard to get rid of. So um, a very dreaded pest and eradicating it is very difficult. Um, so the first thing I want to do is basically just describe for you what are broad mites. Um, they're, you know, a garden pest, obviously. Um, they're very, very tiny. Uh, very tiny, re almost hard, impossible to see without some type of magnification. Um, they usually lay their eggs on the underside of new leaves because they like to eat the new leaves. Um, they puncture through the leaf to get to the sap of the of the plant. So um, they like younger leaves. So they're going to always be closer to uh, the tops of your plants uh, or the tops of each individual branch as it's growing. Um, because like I said, they they prefer that fresh new growth. Uh, I think they can get into it a little easier um, with their pinchers or whatever it is. Um, so uh, first you're gonna have to identify that you have this problem. Uh, the first signs are the signs of a lot of different things like yellowing, yellowing foliage, um, curling, drooping leaves, stunted growth. That could be a pH issue. That could be a, a uh, nutrient issue, or it could be a bug issue. So you're gonna have to Look a little bit further, use, like I said, a magnifying glass um, and basically look for the symptoms of actual broad mites, which would be the eggs and the mites themselves on the newest growth of your plant, uh, that yellowing footed foliage, um, any type of stunted growth, curling, drooping leaves, um, also a glossy wet look to the top of the leaves. That's kind of like this weird um sap that they leave behind and it, it, it kind of it also basically causes issues uh with your plant it's like you know because the life cycle of the broad mite has four different stages they start as egg um then they become larvae uh then they're nymphs which is like the baby mites and then they're adult broad mites so you're gonna have all different ones of all of those different stages if uh if you you see the signs of them because they're already uh, going to have several generations at that point. They're so tiny um, and so very difficult to discover them until it's really close to too late. Uh, so 
uh, keep in mind, they do have uh, that toxic saliva, that like juice that they spit out basically, which can also uh, stunt, stunt your plant and uh, cause the leaves to, to look different, malformed, um, and to grow kind of messed up. Uh, again, they're on the younger, tender uh, leaves, so they're going to be found uh, higher up in your plants uh, where the fresh new growth is. Um, as far as getting rid of them, uh, the first step, if you have a pretty bad infestation, is to remove the affected areas. Now, if your plants are in the vegetative stage, this is pretty easily done um, by just cutting off a lot of that fresh new growth, um, because that's where most of the eggs and, and mites will be. Um, they're going to be on other parts of the plant too, but that's where a majority of them are. So if you can, and I know this can be troublesome and, and hurt people, uh, but you could just cut off, you know, the top uh, two or three inches of every branch. And that really will help get rid of a, a, a large infestation. Um, I don't recommend neem oil anymore. I used to, I prefer just regular insecticidal soap. So uh, you can use that on the plant. Make sure you get the underside of the leaves because uh, that's where they lay the eggs. Um, there are certainly predator mites uh, that work on broad mites as well. There's one known as a broad mite killer, uh, and that is Amblesius andersoni. Uh, but if you just look up, you know, predators for broad mites, you'll find them, and you you want to release them at the top of the plant again because that's where the uh, that's where most of the mites will be. Uh, and then there's different sort of pesticides and miticides that that are are can be used, but I do think that that's kind of overkill. Um, I think just the basic insecticidal soap uh, combined with some predatory mites um, should do the trick. Uh, you really want to try to prevent getting broad mites at all. So uh, that can come from clones. Uh, so you don't, you know, if you if you are taking in clones from somewhere, a nursery or a friend or, or, or wherever it might be, uh, you want to make sure to dip those clones if you can, if they're small and you can dip them uh, in some of that insecticidal soap. Uh, and and quarantine them, keep them away from your other plants until you're you're clear that they're not infected. And uh, if not, just start from seeds, and you'll know that uh, your you know any infestation will be your fault and not not the fault of uh, the person you're getting the clones from. Um, and you know, just the important thing is really just to look at your plants a lot and and use a a, a loop or a microscope or something that'll really get you in there because if you see the eggs. That means there's adults, and if there's adults, there's all the different stages. There's the nymphs and, and everything else. So uh, that is my primer on dealing with and getting rid of broad uh, russet mites or broad mites on cannabis. All right, excellent. Very good grow tip. And as our listeners know, that brings us to the question and answer portion of the show. If you have a question you would like answered on the show, get in touch with us. You can email us, that is info at growbudyourself.com. We also look for questions on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram, YouTube, and especially Patreon. So get us your questions. And let's start things off here with, let's see here. Let's start with Kenny. And he writes, uh, what's up, Danny and Mike? This is Kenny, uh, Blue House Grow on Instagram. I'm in Washington State. My whole family in my house, uh, in my household, we are all medical card growers. I just started listening to your show two weeks ago. I listen eight hours a day while at work. Wow. <laughs> so I reuse soil and uh, use Dr. Earth Dry Amendments. Uh, this grow is the first time I've ever had an issue with my soil pH. It was lower than it should be. I just started using garden lime. I started off low at one tablespoon. But the issue is I don't want to add too much but I don't know how long it takes to take effect. I hope all is well. Keep up the great content. Happy growing. So yeah, any advice here on soil pH to Kenny? Yes. Um, so uh, the garden lime is a good good plan. I mean, that's basically a buffer um, that'll get you closer to neutral uh, from low, from too low. You want to be just below neutral, basically 6.2 uh, or so in soil. Um, the issue might also just be that, that the nutrient solution that you're adding has a very low pH. So I would say test your nutrient solution after you've added the nutrients. Um, and then you can either add some lime to that, or you can uh, use a pH up. Uh, that's natural. So, you know, a different type of pH up uh, and then pour that through your root zone and test 
uh, what comes out afterwards. Uh, so pour a little more than you need to fill the bucket. Uh, and then what comes out uh, from from going through your, your growing medium and your root zone, uh, you test that. And if that's still super low, I would say you can bump up uh, some the lime and just continue to use uh, pH'd nutrient solution or plain water when you're using plain water. Uh, and I think that should be fine. You you can also just test, uh, use one of the simple testers to test the soil uh, and make sure that it's not super low. Uh, but either way, uh, using that lime or using some type of a pH up is going to get you to where you need to be. Uh, and just be careful when you're reusing soil um, that you're not uh, dealing with a lot of pests or, or any kind of... Uh, problems that that can stick with the soil diseases and things so um good luck and thanks all right there you go we hope that helps you out kenny let's uh let's move on to raul raul right uh hi there danny and team i guess that makes me team <laughs> love the show long time listener here's my question i grow auto flowers in sometimes sunny massachusetts outside in pots I've gotten into the habit of moving them into an overhang area under my roof when I'm able to do so and it rains. My thinking is that the water from above will wash off some of the THC <laughs> and other compounds that we love. Uh, is keeping my plants out of the rain a good idea or am I wasting my time? What would you say here to Raul? Uh, yeah, I mean, the issue with rain isn't so much that the water is washing off uh, THC and compounds. Uh, it's just that uh, heavy rain can do damage to your your branches, uh, and rain tends to have a pretty low pH as well. That's why sometimes they call it acid rain. Uh, so you know, there's nothing wrong with bringing plants in uh, from when it's raining hard, uh, but you know, the the rain can be a good thing too. It's almost like a foliar feed uh, in some ways, not a feed so much, but it can clean the dust uh, and certain particles on your leaves that are there. Um, just from being outside. So uh, a light rain is not going to really do any serious damage. A heavy duty uh, thunder shower uh, with a lot of wind uh, can do some damage. So I would say bring the plants in if you feel like they're going to get damaged. Uh, but if it's just a nice light, you know, summertime rain, uh, that's not really going to hurt them too bad. Uh, another thing you should remember, though, is if it rains uh, and then suddenly gets really sunny, right after the rain um that's that's a time when you can actually burn the leaves of the plants because the water magnifies the sunshine and really any of that uh water that's basically on your leaves acts like a magnifying glass and and you can fry your plants uh so i would say you know shake them off and 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 let them dry out before uh putting them in out into full sun if they're soaked all right there we go thanks raul we hope that helps you out um, let's do one more here. This comes from Steve, who is in Idaho. He writes, uh, hey, GBY guys, this might be an obvious one, but I've been having some issues with my plants wilting. I'm sure the excessive heat this summer isn't helping, but I think the bigger problem is watering. I can't seem to figure out the right schedule. Uh, do you have any quick tips on watering? Also, do you recommend soil slash water meters? I bought a couple packs of the soil sticks off Amazon, but not sure how accurate they are. So what would you say here to Steve? Uh, yeah. So as far as watering tips, uh, the easiest and, and best tip I've ever gotten and used is just to lift up the pot itself um, because you really get an idea of when it's fully saturated and when it needs to be watered uh, just by lifting it and how light or heavy it is. Um, and I would just do that all the time you know, just every day. Uh, and plants that are outside in, in full sun are going to need watering in some cases, like every, I've, certainly in many cases every day, and in other cases, like more than once a day, uh, because of the excessive sunlight and heat um, that can use up a lot of that water, evaporate it, the plants use it, and, uh, you know, the sun just basically bakes it right out of your pot. So if you have plants outside in full sun, um, you really need to have a good, decent schedule to water them pretty much almost every day, I would say, especially as they get bigger and tend to use up a lot of water very quickly. Um, 
I don't think your problem is going to really be overwatering, particularly because the wilting sounds like you're underwatering. Uh, if there's nothing wrong with the soil or water meters that you can buy, they're like a metal stick that you just dip down, um, and that'll give you an idea if there's moisture further down in your container. Um, if the plants aren't in pots and they're just out in the garden, you can't really lift them up and know. Um, but in in the heat of the summer, you really it's hard to overwater outdoor plants in the summertime. So keep them well watered and they should not be wilting. Um, now, if they're wilting because they're overwatered, that's a whole other story. But that looks slightly different than the wilting that you'll get when they're underwatered. Uh, so, it, you know, they'll look they'll look like they're they're wilting, but they're moist rather than uh, hanging down. Uh, and then what happens is as soon as you water uh, a plant that's really dry, within a half hour to an hour or so, you'll, you'll see it bounce. The leaves no longer wilted and they'll bounce right back up. Um, if they're still wilted or they're wilted even more, then your problem could be overwatering. But uh, I'm guessing your problem is underwatering. Uh, if you want to get yourself one of those uh, soil meters, that'll tell you. Uh, some, sometimes they'll tell you multiple things. They'll tell you. Uh, how dry the soil is. They'll tell you the pH of the soil. Um, and they can even tell you the parts per million of nutrient solution uh, or the EC, uh, electrical conductivity uh, in the soil. So um, nothing wrong with them. But again, if you just want to lift up the pots, uh, you'll definitely get an idea. If it's light, uh, the plant is dry and needs water. All right, there you go. We hope that helps you out there, Steve. And thank you to everybody who wrote in this week. If you have a question you would like answered, get in touch with us. The email, as always, is info at growbudyourself.com. What do you say we take a little break, come back and wrap this one up? Let's do it. If you're a grower or you're thinking about starting your first crop, then you need to know about Sweet Leaf Plant Nutrients. Sweet Leaf has an incredible line of organic fertilizers and of course, their legacy line that includes organic and some synthetic fertilizers. Check them out at sweetleaf.com. That's S-U-I-T-E-L-E-A-F.com. The code DANKO15 gets you 15% off everything at Sweet Leaf. That's 15% off their signature line of nutrients as well as essentials like complete indoor hydroponic grow tent kits and grow lights, plus awesome apparel, backpacks, and much more. If you join our Patreon, you'll get access to additional codes worth 20 and even 25% off. Patreon supporters also receive free Sweet Leaf nutrients just for signing up. Sweet Leaf provides all the tools necessary for the modern gardener. Check them out at sweetleaf.com and remember the code DANKO15. All right, welcome back. Let's wrap up the show. Thank you to DJ Jacques and Winstrong. Thank you to AJ Sour Diesel, Joe Murray. Uh, keep an eye out for the Sours here in New York, uh, legal and licensed. Um, shout out to our sponsors, of course, Seeds Here Now. Uh, the code there, Danko Ship, for free shipping uh, on all their seeds. Uh, Sweet Leaf Nutrients, Danko 15 for 15% off, along with uh, even more percentages off if you sign up for our patreon uh excelsior extracts check out their thc infused pain relief rub um prime superior inoculant uh an amazing inoculant very good for your plants uh and also 15 percent off using the code ps420 uh at prime superior and of course our newest advertiser we're very excited purple rose supply uh they make canagar molds uh blunt rollers to you can create your own uh, cannabis canagars. You can use the leaves of your plants, or you can use all kinds of different wraps. And the code there is GBY20 for 20% off uh, at Purple Rose Supply. And of course, I should also mention our affiliate links at vapor.com. Uh, you can use the code GrowBudYourself20 for 20% off everything at vapor.com, uh, which includes every vaporizer, all, every rolling paper, every tray. Um, CBD products, all kinds of amazing stuff at vapor.com. Uh, so if you're in the market, you're out there, you're looking at some Puffco or Volcano or whatever, you know, Dr. Dab or whatever it is that you're looking for, uh, 
buy it at vapor.com and get yourself 20% off uh, with our code grow bud yourself 20. I um, want to thank our Patreon supporters. Uh, we're growing on there. Really appreciate it. Um, anybody that wants to sign up, that's a great way to support the show. Uh, and you get a bunch of free stuff. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can build a community over there. You know, I want to, I want more and more people just to uh, participate in our Patreon for sure. Um, our YouTube subscribers, all, all of you guys out there um, who keep up with us and listen to us, whether you're in the grow room or trimming or, you know, on the treadmill or whatever you might be doing. We really appreciate your support. Um, of course, my co-host and producer, Mike, uh, thank you. And everyone, you know, who just supports the show, spreads the word. Uh, we really appreciate it. Episode number 121. Let's put it in the books. <laughs>